of Nehemiah. We began a, a kind of a gleaning through the book of Nehemiah. And um, one of the things that we, we had that great three days with Brother Gene Kim being here. And what we wanted to do is we want to keep you on that high note. We don't want you to come down off of the wall. Now, a lot of years, how many guys have read the book of Nehemiah? Show me your hands. Good, a few of you have read the book of Nehemiah. Well, historically speaking, the nation of Israel were brought into captivity by the Babylonians, and then the Persians came over and overtook again. And so the, the God's people were in bondage. They were in captivity for several years. And at this particular time, there had been a little bit of the remnant of Israel that were kind of breaking away from the captivity. But the people had lost their homes. Their houses were gone. Everything they owned was taken away from them as a nation. OK, it was no different from what Hitler did in coming in and taking God's chosen people and stripping them of their wealth, their property and literally just destroying them. This is what had happened. This is what had conspired in the in, in prior context of the word of God. And so here we have Nehemiah and God, we seen that God put a burden upon Nehemiah. And then all of a sudden, Nehemiah wants to do something for the Lord. He wants to begin with rebuilding the wall. But you have to understand historically how this worked. The wall is symbolic to the nation of Israel's freedom, redemption, liberty, and revival. And you're going to see by the time we get to Nehemiah chapter 8, we see a great revival take place. But the revival began with the rebuilding building of the wall and so the people had to put the work in on the rebuilding of the wall they had to put their hands to the rebuilding of the wall before the revival would take place there was no restitution there was no revival there was nothing being restored to them as a nation they weren't worshiping God they weren't serving God there was nothing going on between them outside of them being in bondage until they rebuild the wall and then they put themselves in a place of renewal and and revival and restitution with God. Now the sacrifices begin to go up. Now the word of God is being opened and read in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. Now we begin to see things happen. Okay. And so what we've been seeing here is that when they begin to rebuild the wall, we seen that Sam Ballot and Tobiah were coming against them. That is a beautiful illustration. Remember what so things were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning. You guys remember that, right? So those Old Testament principles that we study there, they apply directly to me and directly to you. Well, what is Nehemiah trying to do? He's trying to bring revival. He's trying to bring restitution. He's trying to bring renewal to the people of Israel. Why? It's because they were in captivity. Guys, you have to understand something. When you set out to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ, when you set out to do a work for God, you are going to have opposition, you're going to have persecution, and you're going to have tribulation. People are going to come against you. Not only people but we've seen he, we, we we looked at this individual he was called the destroyer of the what the Gentiles remember that and the Bible's clear that you have an adversary the devil who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour so here we have this war going on with Tobiah and Sam Ballot and they are literally persecuting Nehemiah for the rebuilding of the wall because those individuals Sam Ballot and Tobiah they didn't want to see the nation of Israel have freedom and liberty anymore they didn't want to see God's chosen people have renewal and restoration and revival they didn't want to see that and you have to understand something here the enemy doesn't want you to have renewal revival and restitution with God the enemy does not want you to bring worship and sacrifice to God the enemy wants to destroy the work of God in your life the enemy wants to keep you from going up to the wall and doing what God's caused you to do now here's the sad part of it there's a lot of Christians that never went up to the wall so they don't even know what it means to come down because they never went up but those of you who have gone up and you've put your hand to the work of God and you've done some things for God right and you're laboring for the Lord Jesus Christ and you're fighting battles that you're dealing with every day and you're in that thing and you are working for the Lord and you've committed yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and you went up on that wall and you have been working and laboring for the Lord the enemy wants to bring you down but those of you who've never gone up you've never experienced the renewal nor the revival or the restitution that God wants you to experience. See, that's, that's the sad part. A lot of Christians, right, they look at some of you and they go, man, I don't want to get involved in all that Christian labor. I don't want to get involved in ministry. I don't want to do those things. I, I just want to stay down here. Well, as long as you stay down there, you are still in bondage and you are still in captivity. 
That's why your, your pleasures are in the world. That's why you seek worldly things and not spiritual things. That's why you can't wrap your mind around some Christians that get so excited for the things of God and serving God and doing what God's called them to do. Why? It's because you're still down there with the Babylonians and the Persians. You're still a slave. You're a slave to the world. But those of you who've gone up, you're like, man, I never want to go back down, right, Pat? Like, I never want to go back down. I don't want to go back down. Because once I get off that wall, I'm vulnerable. Guys, they will tell them, hey, come on down, come on down. If they came down and took their weapons down, you know what they would have done? They would have killed them. They would have killed them. That was the whole plot. The enemy wants to disrupt and to destroy you from doing what God has called you to do. And if he can't get you down off of the wall, by all means, the ones of you who've never gone up, he will keep you from never going up. That's how it works. So you have the average Christian, the average church, you've got about, you know, I think it's like maybe 10% of the people who do all the work in the average church. It's literally like, it's probably even less than 10%. Is it less than 10%? It's probably less than 10%. And then you have everybody else that is down there on the ground and they've never went up to the wall and said, I'm going to start laboring for the Lord. They've never climbed the wall. They've never went up top. Therefore, they don't even know what it means to have true victory. They don't even know what it means to serve God. They don't even know what it means to put their hand to the very work of God. They don't know what it means to have revival, restitution, and, 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 revel and, and, um, and revival. They don't understand that. To them, it's just they're down there, not at the top of the wall, laboring for the Lord. Let's see what happens here. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, we'll pick it right up in verse 1. And look at this, right? And it came to pass. Now, before we even dive into this, remember we talked about Nehemiah's burden. You guys remember that? You remember they came to Nehemiah and they told him what happened? Let's do this. Turn back there to, um, to Nehemiah chapter 1 really quick, right? Let's just look at, do, do this really quick. It just kind of, I just want to bring your memory, quicken your mind again once more on just the, what had happened in the very beginning, right? So if you were to look at Nehemiah chapter 1, right? And it says, in, we'll pick it up in verse 3, right? Actually, pick it up in verse 2. And Hananiah, one of my brethren, they came, uh, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped, that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant, that's the nation of Israel, the people, God's people, God's chosen people, that are left of the captivity there in the, in the province are in great, say it out loud, they're what? They're in great affliction. They lost their lands. They lost their homes. They have no money. They, they have no food. They are, they're, they are hurting people right now. And reproach. Now look at he says, then he addresses the wall. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates thereof burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and say it out loud. He what? He wept and he mourned, right? Certain days and he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, right? So now he's, he's completely broken, right? He has what is called a burden, all right? Now, let me explain this to you, right? A burden is to, is to want to see something happen. A burden is something that God has placed in your heart. It's something that God has put deep inside of you, whether it be a burden for souls, whether it be a burden for ministry, whether it be a burden to do what God's called you to do. But when you get so close to God, God implements a burden with inside of you, and it changes the way you think. And it'll bring you to the point where you begin to weep for people. It'll bring you to the point where you want to do something for God. That's what a true burden does, right? A true burden, it brings, watch, it works like this. You, first of all, you have a burden, which turns into a conviction, and then that turns into an action. This is what happens with Nehemiah. He has a burden. That burden turns into a conviction, and then what does he do? It turns into an action. When somebody has a true burden, and they have a true conviction, it will turn into an action. They will do something. A lot of Christians come to church, but they never reach the point where they get burdened for souls. They never reach the point where they get burdened for ministry. They never get to the point where they get burdened for the work of God. And therefore, they never receive a conviction. And without the conviction, there will be no action. This is why you have a lot of people that will come to church. And like I said, they're not actively involved. It's all going to start with a burden, a conviction, and then it'll transform into an action. 
He said, Pastor Mike, where does that burden come from? Listen, it comes from something very simple. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's literally that simple, guys. It's, literally, it's, it's not a complex thing. It's not some theological thing that you have to study out. Listen, once you put people in front of yourself, God will give you that burden. Some of us are so self-centered that, that God couldn't even give us a burden because all we're concerned about is me, myself, and I. See, the burden comes when you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you love your what? Neighbor as yourself. That's when God, that's when your heart is soft and God can implement the burden inside of you. But you've got to humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Listen, Nehemiah had this burden because of his love and his passion for his people. That's what he was concerned about. Listen, if you need a burden for souls, you should be able to look at this world and to see the condition of the lost people in this world, to see how spiritually lost they are, to see how spiritually dead they are, to see that they are going to die and going to end up in hell. Now, if that doesn't doesn't give you a burden I don't know what else will I don't know what else will what about that family member that's lost what about that niece or that nephew what about that grandmother that grandfather what about that mom or dad what about that teacher what about somebody in your life who is on their way to hell how can that not produce a burden with inside of you Amen. see what it did with Nehemiah he looked at the condition of the people and he became overwhelmed because he loved God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and he loved his neighbor as himself. So now God implements this burden into his life. Now he has this burden. Now he has a strong conviction, okay? Nothing's going to turn him back from his conviction. He's at a point right now, the burden is overwhelming. The burden is so powerful in his life that nothing is going to turn him back. The adversary wasn't going to turn him back. The opposition wasn't going to turn him back. The persecution wasn't going to turn him back. Why? The burden, then the conviction. Now he's going to implement it into an action. He's going to say, I'm going to stop building this wall. See, a true burden, it produces conviction, which produces an action. We've got people in here that have never put their hands to the work of God. And some of you, honestly, I don't expect you to until you go through discipleship one, discipleship two, and really find out what your ministry is. But a, you, if you develop a burden, God will give you a craving for that. You see? God will give you that craving for that. Nehemiah's burden. He's literally fasting and weeping for the people. He's fasting. He, he doesn't eat for days. He's fasting and he's weeping certain days. Then look what he does in verse 5, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. I love the way he calls him terrible, right? Man, that is one of God's names. Terrible means awesome, powerful, you know, beyond your belief, beyond your understanding, right? It goes on, God, that keepeth covenant and mercy uh, for them that love him and observe his commandments. Now look at this. Let, let, let thy ear now be attentive and thy, eye, and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. So his burden brings him to this action of prayer before he does anything, okay? Now watch what happens here. He goes to a servant, which, which I pray before thee now day and night. He was praying day and night for his people, right? Because they were so pressed upon his heart, the condition of the people. Now watch this. For the children of Israel, thy servants confess, uh, he says here, and, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. Notice the first thing he does. He praying for the forgiveness of their sins which we he includes himself have sinned like Daniel did against thee both I and my father's house have sinned we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments look at this he says nor the statues nor the judgments which thou commanded uh, thy servant Moses so now he's confessing his sin you have to understand something the reason why they were in captivity was because of what you guys with me on this it was because they were brought into bondage. It was because they were brought in because of their sin. So they were brought into bondage because of their disobedience to God, because of their rebellion towards God. That's what sin does. The Bible talks about sin. It will make you a slave. Sin to idolatry, sin to drugs, sin to immorality. It will make you a slave and it'll put you into bondage. Fear, anxiety, depression, those things are all sin. Those things will consume you. And people are in bondage to these things. Listen, God doesn't want you to be in bondage. He come to set us what? He come to set us free. 
Okay? So now, let's see what happens here, because this is very important, what's going on here, right? So now, what's the first thing he does? He goes and he deals with the issue of sin. Now let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4, okay? Now that we have the groundwork. So Nehemiah has a, con he has a, a burden that transfers into what? A conviction that transfers into what? An action. Now he's doing something with it. He's not just responding to the word of God and to the things of God. He's not just responding to it and listening to it. Now he's going to do something about it. Some people come to church, right? And they hear message after message after message, but they don't do anything with it. That's a fact. It is a fact. See, and, and the Holy Spirit can't give them the burden. So therefore, they're living without conviction. And therefore, they don't have any action in their life in really serving God in ministering, revival, renewal, restitution in the lives of people. Now look at this. Let's see what happens here. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, right? But it came to pass that when Samballot heard that we built the wall, he was what? He was wroth, and he took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews. Notice that? Well, why is he so mad? Why is this individual so mad? Because he knew that if the wall was to be rebuilt, they would be restored as a nation. Do you understand that? He knew that if that wall was going to be rebuilt, that they were going to be restored as a nation. Not only were they going to be restored as a nation, they were going to be restored as God's people. And then they would get back to worship and serving God. That's why when you get to Nehemiah chapter 8, that's what we see. But before anything could happen, the wall had to be rebuilt, and then the revival would take place. Now watch what happens here, right? They had indignation, and they mocked the Jews, and, and he spake before, before his brethren and the, and, the army, and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Now notice what they're doing, right? They're mocking, they're attacking, right? The devil and the enemy is always giving them a sense of inadequacy. OK, he's giving them a sense of inadequacy where they feel inadequate in serving the Lord, where they feel inadequate as though they can't do what God has called them to do. There are a lot of people that won't get involved in ministry because they have a deep sense of inadequacy that comes from the devil himself. The Bible says our sufficiency is of who? Our sufficiency is of God. Not that we are sufficient within ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. When God called Moses, Moses couldn't talk. And Moses says, God, I can't speak. And God says, I'll do it for you. And he did it for him. He did it for him. Hey, keep that door closed because it's going to get 100 degrees in here. Don't open that door again. You guys don't want me up here in a full-blown sweat, do you? All right, now watch what happens here, right? So he's given them a sense of inadequacy. That's how the enemy works. The enemy wants to bring despair, discouragement, and inadequacy in your life, as though you can't do anything right, as though you can't serve God, as though there's nothing good in you where you can't build the wall and do something for God. That's how the enemy works. That's why a lot of people don't get involved, okay? Now, let's look at this, okay? So remember, the rebuilding of the wall, it identifies with revival, renewal, restitution. It, it, it literally, is, it's a picture of what's going to happen to the nation of Israel in Nehemiah chapter 8, okay? Now, so I want us to do this. I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 6 now, okay? Now, I gave you that verse in Jeremiah. You don't need to look at it. I'm going to read it to you one more time. It says here, the lion is come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way he is gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate and the cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant that's what he wanted to accomplish with God's people now you 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 have to understand something here the enemy wants to disrupt and to destroy and to keep you from going up on that wall and doing what God's called you to do. Right. Now remember, a lot of you, I'm going to be honest, I love you, but some of you have never gone to the wall and put your hand to the work of God. And therefore, you don't even know what it means to serve God. You don't even know what it means to have a burden. You don't know what it means to have a conviction. And by all means, you don't know what it means to have an action. And so the devil just keeps you right there in the world. He just keeps you from climbing up the wall and doing what God wants you to do. 
He's already beaten you. He's already got you down. He's already put you to the point where you are still so engulfed with the affairs of this life that you will not put forth your hands to do what God's called you to do. That's how the enemy works. And the scary thing is, right, here's the scary part. You are the ones that will miss out on the blessings. See, you think your job, your career, and all these things are your blessings. No, those are the curse. They keep you. What did the devil offer Jesus when he said, bow down and worship me? He says, I'll give you what? The kingdoms of the world. I'll give you everything you want. But the ones of you who have gone up to the wall and you've put your hand and you've been laboring for the Lord Jesus Christ and you put your hands to the work, you look down and the enemy tries to get you to come down. You're like, nope, I'm doing a great work. I am not coming down. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to stop. Now, let's look at this. Nehemiah chapter six, right? Nehemiah chapter six, verse one. Now, it came to pass when Sam Bala and Tobiah and now he's got a couple other enemies here and, and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian. He got the beast, the false prophet and the Antichrist. You got all three of them working here now. Watch this. And the rest of our enemies heard that I that that I, that I had builded the wall. And that there was no breach left therein. All right. Now watch this. Though that at that time I had n I had not set up the doors nor the gates that Sam Bala and Gresham, they sent unto me saying, come, look at this. Let us let us meet together in some in some one in some one of the villages in the plain of it says on Right. But they thought to do me what? They're like, hey, guys, come on down. You guys are working too hard. You guys, man, you're, you're, you've been laboring up there for the Lord. You're overworking yourself. You're getting consumed with this whole thing called Christianity. You're consumed with discipleship. You're consumed with winning people to the Lord and building their lives. You are taking this thing too far. You're going overboard. Come on down and let's have a meeting. Let's take this. Now that place, right? It was near Lydia. It was a six mile journey. So now they're going to have to come down, walk a six mile journey, and then the enemy was going to kill them. You guys get that? That's what was going to happen. That's exactly what was going to happen, right? Now, let's just think about this. What happens here, right? Let's look at Nehemiah's response in verse 3. Verse 3, right? And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing what? Man, I'm doing something for God. Nehemiah says, listen, I am doing a significant work. Now, guys, let me explain something to you here, right? How many of you guys have read a book of Ecclesiastes? Let me explain something to you. Your labor on this earth means nothing. Do you know that? Your labor on this earth, it doesn't mean anything before God and who he is. Let me tell you something. Your labor on this world, it'll keep you from doing what God's called you to do. Your job, your career, your ambitions, your motives, your desires, and your passions, it will keep you from going up to that wall and serving God. It'll keep you from doing it. You know what the funny thing is? The people who didn't go up to rebuild the wall would never experience the renewal and the revival and the restoration. They never experienced it. They stayed down there with the Persians and remained in bondage and captivity. That's why they're living the way they live. Tense, frustrated, fearful, confused, not fulfilled. No pleasure, no real desires until they what? Get to the wall. And now they put their hands for the work of God. Now they have the joy of the Lord, which is their strength. Now they have the power and the anointing of God. Now, they, they, Nehemiah is not even afraid at this point. Let me tell you something. The people on the wall, they weren't afraid. The ones that weren't on the wall were afraid. They were the ones that were living with fear, depression, and anxiety. Why? It's because they weren't on the wall doing what God's called them to do. Look at this. And I sent messages unto them saying, look at this. I am doing a great work. So they say it all out. Everyone, I what? I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? The enemy wants to bring you down, guys. It's that simple. He wants to bring you down to a level where he can destroy you. Guys, it's literally that simple. 
The enemy wants to bring you down mentally, emotionally, psychologically. He wants to bring you down. He wants to keep you from going up on the wall and serving God. This is why, once again, a lot of us have never even went up and climbed and put our hands to the work of God. And we don't even know what it means. We miss out on the joy of the Lord. But those of you who have gone up on the wall and you've been laboring year after year after year for the Lord Jesus Christ and you've put your hand to the work of the ministry and you've been serving in the church and you've been doing what God's called you to do, the enemy is trying to bring you down. He wants to bring you down. Man, he doesn't want you walking and working for the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you on the top of the wall. He wants to bring you down and bring despair and discouragement in your life. He says, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. I'm doing something for God. Now, notice what kept him there. It was his burden and it was his conviction that made this action come to pass. Guys, he's like, I am not coming down no matter what. He's not coming down. Now, look at this. Why should the work cease? Why should this stop? Whilst I leave it and come down to you. Now, look at this. Yet they sent unto me four times after the sort. And I answered, look at this, and I answered them, look at this, after the same manner. Then sent, look at this, then sent his servant unto me in like manner, I, the fifth time with an open letter. Now, just, now they're going to get a little drastic here. I always bring the servant, he brings a letter. You got to come down. You got to stop this. You've got to stop this renewal. You've got to stop this revival. You've got to stop this resti restitution. You've got to stop the work of God. You've got to cease in doing what, the, what God wants you to do. But Nehemiah's burden and his conviction would never stop his action. Now, look at this, right? Look at verse 6, right? Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 6. Watch this. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, that, that Geshem, Geshemu saith it, that thou and the, and, the, and the Jews think to rebel. Now see that? For which cause thou buildest the wall that thou mayest be, be, may be their king according to these words, okay? Now they're looking at it and they're making accusations. This is an act of rebellion. No, it's an act of freedom and redemption and revival. You see, they don't understand what it is. Well, they do, but they want to hinder the work. Verse 7, and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of, of thee at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to, according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Let us get together. We have to have a meeting, right? And look at verse 8. Then I sent unto them, saying, there are no, look at this, there are no such things done as thou sayest. You're just lying. You're making up these accusations. But thou, but thou uh, frainest them out of thy own heart. In other words, these things are coming out of your own heart, right? Uh, for they all made us, look at it says, they made us afraid, saying their hands shall be weakened from the work. Look at this, that it be not done now thereof. Oh, what is, oh God, strengthen my hands. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to weaken the hands of the work of God. Those of you who have been involved in ministry for any time, you're going to know that there's going to be times when the enemy's going to come to you and he's going to weaken your hands. He might try to weaken you mentally, emotionally. He might try to instill fear in you. But those of you who've never gone up to do the work, you don't even know what I'm talking about. See, this only applies to the people who've gone up to the wall and who have put their hands in the ministry. And they're working with their hands, ministering to people, building up lives and restoring and bringing redemption and renewal to people's lives. Those of you who haven't done it, you're still down there under the bondage of the Persians. That's why you're so consumed with life. That's why, you know, you can't even make it to church. You can't get involved, you know, once a week. Sometimes some guys only come once a month and it's like there's no, no true involvement. Well, why is that? Because they're still a slave to the Persians and the prince. Watch this. And the prince and the power of the what? The heir. The God of what? This world. Satan. Trying to, you who are doing the work, you have to stay strong because the enemy is trying to weaken your hands. 
And what does he do? Nehemiah cries out in the latter part of verse 9, Oh God, strengthen my hands. God, give me the strength to do what you've called me to do. God, give me the strength to rebuild lives. God, give me the strength to invest my time and my energy and my strength into the life of other people. Verse 10, Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah and, and, the, son of, and the son of Deliah and the son of Me Methabel, who was shut up. Now watch this. And he said, let us meet together. Now, this is different now because now he's using somebody that is closer to him to pull him down. Okay? So now he's using, they're using a, 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 an, an ally with Nehemiah, but the ally is really an enemy. Now, watch this. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple. Hey, let's come down to this familiar place. We're going to go into the temple. We've been working on the temple. Let's come down into the temple. Let's have this meeting. Let's talk about what you're doing. For they will come to slay thee. They're going to come kill you. Now watch this. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. They're going to come kill you in the night. So let's hide in this temple. And I, and I said, so such a man as I flee, you think I'm going to run? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life. Look at he tells him, say it out loud, I will what? I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. No, you, listen, I don't care if they're going to kill me. I'm not coming down and I'm not compromising. No matter what opposition they're going to bring, no matter what persecution this world's going to bring, there's going to be Christians. When persecution gets tough, they're going to run. Well, if that's you, you better just leave right now. Nehemiah is like, nope, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The work was too important. The mission in his life was too important. It was for the redemption of his people. Guys, you've got to remember, what were they fighting for? They were fighting for their freedom, their liberty, their restitution with God, their revival. They, this is, guys, this is what is going on. That's what they're working for. Some of us don't even take life seriously. We're so consumed with the right now and the present things. It's very disturbing. I mean, let's face it. If somebody came into your home and tried to strip you of your home, most of us men, we'd be like, oh, we'll fight. Rightfully so. But you've got a far worse being than any man that is going to walk through that door that is stripping your minds of your children, destroying your home spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally, that are being led astray, and we don't do anything to put forth our hands to the work of God, to defend what we love and care for. To me, it doesn't make any sense. I know some of you guys personally, somebody come through your door, you're going to tackle them and do what you can to kill them. But meanwhile, the devil's walking through the door and he's walking all up in your house day after day after day. And you don't do anything about it. He's called the destroyer of the Gentiles. We just seen that. He came out, the lion is out of the thicket. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Those of you who've been at the wall working and laboring, he wants to do whatever he can to take you down. Now here he's using a familiar individual to take him down from the very work of God. They're trying to instill them with fear. Look at verse 12. This is wild, guys. Look at this, right? Verse 12. Look at, now notice Nehemiah. This is all based, look at guys, stay with me. He has, a, he has a what? He has a burden. He has conviction. He puts it into action. Now you know what God gives him through all of this? He gives him discernment. Okay? He gives him discernment. You know what the, one of the saddest things is? Is that there are Christians that have absolutely no discernment. They don't know what is up or what is down. There are some Christians, they don't even know how important it is to be in church on a regular basis. They don't know how important it is to go through discipleship one and discipleship two. Why don't they know? You say, Pastor Mike, how do you know they don't know? Because they've never put it into action. 
When you put something into action, that means you have discernment. And that means you're going to make application to your life. Nehemiah has all this discernment. He has all this wisdom. Why? It's because he's doing what God's called him to do. Some of us, we're so far from God and we, we've got our minds already made up that we have no discernment whatsoever in our lives. We don't even know what God wants us to do. We don't even know what God's called us to do. And the sad part of it is some of us don't even give a flip. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? I'm never coming back. That's on you. Now look at this. Watch what he says here. Look at this. Now, remind you, this is a familiar individual, right? Who's, this is a, a, a tactic from the enemy, right? He says, and look at this. Nehemiah says, and lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. <laughs> He's like, wait a second. The Holy Spirit says, hey, Nehemiah, I didn't send him. But that he, say it out loud, he what? Pronounced his prophecy, say it out loud, what? Against me, for Tobiah and Sambal, they what? Man, God gave him the wisdom and says, man, this guy's coming right from the pit of hell. Don't you love it when God gives you that wisdom? Man, God gives you that wisdom and you could see right through things. God, you could see right through people. You could see right through life what is happening. Here's the scary part. Some of us are so disconnected to the Bible. We're so disconnected to the word of God. We're so disconnected to the will of God. We don't have any discernment. So what do we do? We act on impulse because we don't have any discernment. So when it's time to cuss, do this, do that, we just go ahead and do it. We just think what we want to think, act how we want to act, say what we want to say. is because we don't have any discernment. And then when it comes to applying biblical principle, we can't do that because we don't have any discernment. So the word of God is not opening up to us. See, you've got to, you've got to love that book more than anything. You've got to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Then God will give you that discernment along. He will give it to you alongside of your burden and your, and, your, and your connection with God. He will give you alongside of that as you begin to put these things into action in your life. Now watch what it says. Look at verse 13. He says, therefore was, I, was he hired that I should be afraid. You see that? He hired him specifically to bring fear into his life. The enemy lives and thrives off of your fear. Do you understand that? Guys, stay with me. God hasn't given us the spirit of what? Fear, but of what? Power, and of what? And of love, and of a sound mind. Hey, that's that thing of fear, it's a demonic, satanic spirit. I don't care what it is, when you feel fearful, when you feel anxiety, and you feel worry, that is not coming from God. The enemy wants to instill fear in them to keep them from doing the work of God. The enemy will keep you from going up and doing the work of God. He'll fill you with fear. I can't do it. I can't do it. He'll fill you with fear. What's going to happen? How am I going to set my life up? How can I give myself to the things of God? He'll fill you with fear to keep you from going up to the wall. And then those of you who are on the wall doing the work, he will fill you with fear to try to bring you down and try, to discourage, and try to discourage you. Now watch what happens here, though. This is awesome. Watch how Nehemiah's discernment works. Look at verse 13. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid. Now watch this. And do so, and what? Sin. Did you guys see that? <laughs> Whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. Did you know that fear is sin? How many guys knew that? Put your hand up. When you're afraid, of, when you're worried about this and stressed out about that, that is sin. That's sin in your life. Nehemiah addresses this. He says that I should be afraid and do so and sin. Now watch this. And that they might have, ma uh, might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. So in other words, they were looking for a reproach against him. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Simbalat according to these, their works and, and, uh, and on the prophetess Nabiah and the rest of the prophets that would put me in fear. So now he's praying against these people. So the wall was finished in 20 and in 20 and five days uh, to the month of Elul uh, in the 50 and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all watch this and all the heathen 
that were about us saw these things. Now watch what happens. They were what? They were much cast down in their own eyes. For they perceived this work was wrought of what? Of God. Don't you like that, man? How about putting a spin on things, right? How about putting a spin on things? Here the enemy is. He's coming against you. He's doing everything he can to keep you from climbing to that wall and putting your hands to the work of the ministry. How about doing this, right? How about stop living in fear and get up there and do it and then give the enemy fear? How about you getting to the work of God? How about you getting involved in discipleship one, discipleship two? How about you getting a burden and living with conviction and having action in your life and then literally putting your adversary down? Amen. That's how I want to live. Now, some of you are already living a defeated Christian life. Hey, listen, we're all going to have good days, bad days. Some days you're going to lose the battle. Some days you're going to win them. But some of us have been on a losing street forever. Guys, rise up. Put your hands to the work of God. Restoration, renewal, revival, worship, sacrifice. Invest your life into the life of somebody else. Be committed to the things of God. Some of us are more committed to the things of the world than we are the things of God. We're more committed to our jobs, our careers, our finances, making money. We're more committed to the things that don't mean anything. Because you're going to stand before a holy and a righteous God someday. And the only thing that's going to matter is the labor that you worked with your hands for the ministry of people and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to matter. We need to labor for the master from the dawn's of setting sun. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for who you are. Lord, I, I know that there's people here I love dearly, but they've never climbed, they never went up to the wall. Help them to understand how important it is for their family to bring revival, restoration, and renewal to their family, their children, their wives, their mothers, dads, their cousins. Unless they go to the wall, there will be no renewal, restoration, revival, worship, or sacrifice. I pray for those people that you help them to make a decision this morning. Give them a burden where they begin to weep and cry for their family members. Give them a conviction like Nehemiah and help that burden and that conviction transform into an action. Help us to stop being so consumed with the things of this world and help us to get on the wall so we can do what you've called us to do. I pray for the people who are laboring now and they're on that wall ministering. They've got a weapon in one hand and their other hand is used, being used to minister to the lives and to bring renewal, restitution, and revival. I pray that you would encourage them, remove all fear, worry, distress give them the grace that they that they need I pray for us that have been dealing with a familiar spirit like Nehemiah that is trying to get us to come down and to tie us up I pray that you'd give us discernment and wisdom Lord I pray for your people in this room that you would help them to truly see what you want them to do. Give them the discernment to realize that heaven and earth shall pass away, but all, but your words shall not. Help them to realize that the earth and all the work, things that are therein shall be burned up. Help them to realize that. Help us, Lord, to realize not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Lord, I pray that you'd give your people a burden right now this morning. Fill this altar with broken people that have a burden, that have conviction, that will put it into action, that will bring renewal and restoration to everyone around them. We ask you these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to have Trish come and we will do a song of invitation. What page, Trish?